I am Dr. Varunayendra Singh Rawat, Assistant Professor, Hindu College, University of Delhi. I teach zoology and today my objective is to bring to you a topic in evolutionary biology as per your syllabus which will help you to keep in the learning loop. So today I will be talking about an important aspect of evolutionary biology which deals with kin selection. I will be talking about various examples or evidences of kin selection in the natural world. What exactly is kin selection? I have discussed in another lecture, but to give a small insight, kin selection is basically a type of behavior by an organism towards its relative, which ensures the uh, reproductive success of the relative at the cost of reproductive success of the individual. So it is an example of altruistic behavior where an individual sacrifices its own reproductive effort or reproductive success to ensure that its relative has a chance of reproduction and produces young ones. So why does it do so? It does so because it shares genes with the relatives. And because of these shared genes, the individual can sacrifice its own effort, its own fitness, its own reproductive fitness to ensure the reproductive fitness of its relatives. By doing so, it is also ensuring that the similar genes which they share are passed on into the next generation. So, it is uh, that individual is basically enhancing its fitness also because the fitness of relatives is, all, is a part of inclusive fitness of the individual. So, right now I will be discussing certain evidences or certain examples from the natural world which show how kin selection is a very important uh, behavioral aspect in evolutionary biology and how it operates in different, uh, in different phylums and uh, how it uh, ensures that genes are propagated uh, from one generation to next generation of a particular, uh, particular uh, family, genealogical family. So in this particular lecture, I'll be dealing with examples as varied as those shown by prairie dogs, which are not dogs but rodents, a bird known as white fronted bee eater, pied kingfisher, eusocial insects, which are our uh, honeybees and etc., naked mole rats, and then also I'll be uh, talking about a specific aspect of altruism, which is termed as reciprocal altruism. What exactly that means, I'll be talking about uh, in detail later on. So, the learning objectives of the present lecture would be that kin selection uh, which we have discussed earlier separately it can be explained through uh, different real world examples and how kin selection operates in the real world we can learn through these examples and also uh, we'll be learning about how reciprocal altruism works in the real world which is the type of altruism uh, which we as humans are most favorable, um, which uh, we are most, uh, you know, uh, conversant with. Uh, and we know how reciprocal, reciprocality uh, works in the human society. <clears throat> Before moving further on, I had asked certain uh, questions uh, where I, I had asked you to calculate the coefficient of relatedness between uh, different individuals. Like you know that uh, coefficient of relatedness that is denoted by R in the uh, in the equation Br minus C is greater than 0. So R is uh, basically the coefficient of relatedness and in case of full siblings you know the coefficient of relatedness is 1 by 2. Whereas the coefficient of relatedness in case of parent and offspring is also 1 by 2 and in case of half sibling where uh, the siblings share only one uh, parent, one common parent, the, uh, the coefficient of relatedness is 1 by 4. I had asked you to calculate uh, relationship uh, uh, certain questions wherein I had asked you to uh, find out the relationship uh, between re uh, coefficient of relatedness between identical twins. So the coefficient of relatedness or R between identical twins is always 1 because they share the similar genes. That is why between them it is 1. Whereas in the case of fraternal twins, because they are ordinary, uh, or though they are born at the same time, they are ordinary uh, siblings. Okay, they do not share complete genes. So the R between them is one by two. Whereas between aunt or uncle to niece or nephew is one by four, grandparent to grandchild it is one by four. 
So I had also asked a specific question where I had asked you to calculate the coefficient of relatedness between you and the daughter of your mother's first cousin. So the uh, relation between you and your mother's first cousin, what does it become? Uh, the daughter of your uh, mother's first cousin, it becomes that she is your second cousin. So the relationship between your mother and uh, your uh, first cousin is uh, can be calculated very easily. And the uh, relationship between you and uh, your mother is 1 by 2. The relationship between uh, your mother's uh, first cousin and her daughter can be calculated. That is also 1 by 2. What will be the relationship between you and your uh, uh, your mother and your first uh, uh, your mother's first cousin? It will be 1 by 8. So the relationship here will be 1 by 2 into 1 by 8 into 1 by 2. So that comes as... 1 by 2 into 1 by 8 is 1 by 16, 1 by 16 into 1 by 2 is 1 by 32. So relationship between you and the daughter of your mother's first cousin is 1 by 32. So let's proceed with the examples of kin selection. Uh, or the evidences produ uh, produced or uh, produced by the real world uh, towards uh, ensuring that, uh, towards uh, supporting the fact that kin selection does occur. So the first example of, uh, which will be uh, uh, pr uh, presented here by me is that of prairie dog which is a type of rodent and uh, its scientific name is Cynomys species. So the example which is being uh, dealt with here uh, is the alarm calls being produced by prairie dogs. Now the, the uh, prairie dogs, the rodents, they exhibit a very high degree of sociality. That means they live in uh, very tight-knit colonies. So they burrow and these burrows have a large number of individuals which are uh, which are living together. Most, uh, most often they are very closely related and these tight-knit colonies are also termed as coteries. So uh, when these individuals uh, live together, there are various interactions going on and vocalization or producing of sound are an important part of uh, the sociality here. And it is used to manipulate interaction between two individuals. So different kinds of sounds can be produced by uh, prairie dogs uh, under different set of conditions. So basically we are concerned here, uh, here with uh, the alarm calls. So why we are consider, uh, con uh, concerned about the alarm calls, I will be uh, just telling you. So uh, alarm calls basically are uh, the calls which are produced by, an, uh, by a member or by an individual to alert others of coming danger. While the others are alerted, the individuals who produces the alarm call is at, uh, is at grave risk because the call is being produced at a certain specified location and the predator is able to locate that particular location and that individual can be harmed or can be eaten by the predator. So why would an individual produce an alarm call to alert others by, uh, by uh, putting its own life at risk? So what exactly happens here is that these individuals, they are altruistic individuals, they tend to alert others to incoming danger. Now the danger could be terrestrial or it could be coming from the sky like eagle. So for each type of predator which occurs in their surrounding, there is a specific call which is produced by the prairie dog. So uh, how, how does this behavior, uh, this behavior help uh, the actor or the one which is producing the alarm call? Now these prairie dogs, they code specific information as I've already told you and uh, whenever they are calling, it has been observed that they will call more frequently uh, whenever they are in presence of their offspring or they are, present, uh, they are in presence of their uh, own relatives which are very closely related like their parents or brothers, sisters or their offspring. So, uh, Whenever, whenever uh, studies have been done on them, a very beautiful studies have been done on them and uh, the evidence of kin selection has come out very clear uh, in the case of prairie dogs which can be seen in this panel that uh, whenever uh, prairie dogs uh, are present, when they are present uh, in, the, uh, in the coterie without kin, then what, what happens? Then they produce uh, less alarm calls. But when they are present with their kin, they produce higher frequency of alarm calls. That means the uh, number of times the alarm calls are produced will be higher when they are present with their kin as can be seen in uh, this particular panel. Both males and females do produce higher number of calls when they are present with their kin. When they are present with 
kins they yeah, either they could be parents or uh, siblings or their offspring whenever they are present with offspring both males and females are uh, they produce higher number of calls that uh, the chances of their producing alarm calls are higher when they are uh, present with offspring so what exactly is happening here what exactly uh, is happening here that individuals they tend to put their own life at risk to ensure that they can survive so that they can pass on the gene which are shared between them this particular panel shows how when uh, when uh, prairie dogs are living in coterie in the birth coterie with their parents with their siblings and other kin they tend to produce higher number of alarm calls as compared to when they have moved to a separate coterie for breeding where their kin are not pre not present so they uh, tend to move to separate coterie for breeding but if they have not uh, given uh, birth to pups as yet then they would uh, almost not produce any alarm calls that means they will not put their life at uh, danger because they themselves are not, have not produced any pups and no uh, no individual which is present in that coterie is related to them so they will not be putting their life at risk there but when they are living in the breeding coterie and they have produced pups or offspring then they tend to produce higher number of alarm calls and when they are evicted from the breeding coterie and there is no kin nearby then they tend to not uh, not produce or produce at very less frequency so this behavior is very peculiar and it is a very good example of kin selection where an individual tends to put itself life its life in danger to ensure that his or her relatives survive and pass on the genes another very good example of uh, uh, kin selection comes from uh, uh, the bee, a bird known as white fronted bee eater which goes by the scientific uh, scientific name of merops bulacoides now these uh, birds they live in uh, groups so it basically a social unit where a number of uh, nests are present and number of uh, number of couples they tend to lay eggs in uh, in a uh, in a very uh, uh, in a structure where number of individuals are living together so uh, the social unit in this particular bee eater which is a bird bee eater family is an extended clan in which multiple pairs are breeding together that is simultaneously now what do these bird do they uh, tend to uh, tend to lay eggs and they are helped by certain other uh, individual where uh, where in the effort put in by those individuals is uh, is basically quite uh, i can say it's a very great effort to uh, which ensure that uh, the nestlings are raised so these birds are cooperative breeders in which half of all the nesting attempts are assisted by non breeding adults in addition to the breeding pair so generally we see that in uh, bird there is only a pair which raises the nestling which uh, helps in uh, raising the nestling but in bee eater more than two birds more than the parents there are certain other individuals which are recruited to raise the nestling and this is an example of allo parenting also so it has been found that these helper assist in all the aspects of nesting and uh, their help significantly increases the chances of the uh, the nestling being born and uh, they are being uh, becoming adult so the average number of young fledged is 0.51 when there is only the parents and no helpers but each additional helper which comes uh, comes for helping the parents it uh, that helper increases the number of young fledged by 0.47 on average so if we see this figure if the group size is 2 that is only parents are present then the number of fledgling is uh, average number is 0.5 only but if if it becomes 5 then it then it is almost 1.75 if the number of uh, total uh, individuals who are caring for the fledgling that is 5 then the number of fledged individual it becomes 1.75 and for six individuals it become more than 2.5 so we can see that when individuals help then the number of fledgling increases now helpers they have to choose how to allocate their uh, aid because there are number of birds to whom should they provide their aid and that is uh, of course decided by the genealogy those individuals who are closely related uh, to the helper they would be provided the help first and uh, then only uh, then only the uh, the genes which are shared will be passed on they cannot provide help randomly because if they do so then their own genes which they share with uh, which uh, they share with their kin will not be passed on so uh, it has been studied that uh, the helpers if they were actively engaged in some work before uh, before helping the parents uh, what was the what was their reaction 
what was their reaction when uh, they were uh, dealing with close relatives or when they were dealing with far off relatives so this particular graph shows uh, the black peril shows the uh, the uh, uh, the effort being made by the by the helpers before helping the parents and uh, the shaded bar shows the, uh, the effort which was very high uh, may, uh, like for uh, finding food or warding of enemies uh, being done by the helpers before before they help the parents so when they were uh, very closely related uh, then the individuals did uh, they put uh, more of the effort in raising the uh, the fledgling whereas like if we see towards the right hand side if the if the coefficient of relatedness is 0.125 or 0 then very less effort or very less chances are being uh, there for the uh, helper to be recruited for raising the young ones of a particular uh, bird couple now these bee eaters they preferentially ate the closest genetic relatives and it has been seen that average relatedness between helpers and the nestling receiving their aid was 0.33 so this degree of kinship is quite higher as compared uh, if if the helpers uh, were to select nest randomly so there is a high degree of relatedness between the nestling and the helper it has been seen that uh, seen that bee eaters the parent bee eaters they recruit helpers who are younger and who are more closely related to them as we can see the number of uh, uh, number of uh, uh, helpers who are recruited uh, more are recruited if they are young one year of age and less if they are uh, more than one year of age and if they are uh, more closely related they have more chances to being recruited than if they are less closely related another example of uh, altruism is seen in pied kingfisher which has scientific name seril rhodes in kenya kenya Uh, and these also nest colonially and they also exhibit a strongly skewed sex ratio where most of the individuals are male so there are two categories of helpers primary helpers are the grown sons which help their parents to raise their sibling and the average relatedness of the helpers to the nestling is 0.32 whereas there are also secondary helpers who are also males which are join which are join which join the breeding pair after the clutch has hatched and these are initially repelled but they later on they are accepted if the food supply is low the average relatedness of these secondary helpers to the nestling is 0.06 which is very less then why do they do uh, so so uh, these primary helpers which are the sons they bring more food they bring in uh, they put in more effort whereas the secondary helpers they bring less food still they tend to help so they uh, tend to help because they are increasing their probability of obtaining the current breeding female in the pair as their own mate during a later nesting season so this is early nesting season the secondary helpers tend to help them even though their relation is very less because they think that in the later breeding season they might obtain the female as their own partner and then they will pass on their gene through the offspring or through the eggs being laid what about altruism in you social insects i have already discussed uh, it in a separate lecture that uh, uh, these particular insects show high degree of sociality and uh, the relatedness between the female is quite high here so uh, there is one queen which lays all the eggs and workers which tend to the colony which raise the young ones and special drones special individuals that are males in case of honey bees uh, these are drones which fertilize the queen bee now these uh, males are uh, males are uh, haploid because uh, they uh, they arise from the eggs which are not being fertilized by the males whereas the females are diploid so it is a case of haplodiploidy in hymenoptera which includes your ants and birds so let's consider the uh, uh, honey bee males are haploid because they develop from unfertilized eggs and females are diploid hamilton proposed that the haplodiploidy predisposes these hymenopterans to u sociality because females are more closely related to one another their coefficient of relatedness is 0.75 r is equal to 3 by 4 then they are to their own offspring because as we know that parents are related to offspring only by half 1 by 2 that is 0.5 their coefficient of relatedness is 0.5 so females maximize inclusive fitness by being sterile workers and helping to produce reproductive sisters rather than reproducing themselves so both the females they are deriving uh, deriving the half of the genome from the from the mother so and uh, complete genome from the father so it becomes 
one by two plus one, and the average for, uh, one female will be receiving half of it of the genome complement of her mother and complete genome complement of the father. So it becomes one by two plus one. And when you average for two sisters, then it becomes one by two plus one divided by two. That is three by four or point seven five. So female sisters, sisters here, uh, that is worker bees are point seven five related uh, in this particular case. We can also work it out like this. If the female is A1 by A2 at particular locus, male is uh, haploid, so it will be only A3. Sister 1 will uh, either receive A1 from uh, female or A2 from female. And same will be the case with sister 2, but both will receive A3 from father. So if we sum these all up, the maximum uh, similarity could be 4, but uh, actual similarity in this particular locus will be 1 plus 1 plus 0.5 plus 0.5, that is 3. So 3 by 4 is 0.75. So the average pair of identical by descent alleles shared between sisters is 0.75, which is a high degree of similarity. So, uh, but it has been uh, it has been objected to because in uh, in many cases of honeybees, more than one female male may be fertilize the uh, fertilize the queen. So father will be different. So the uh, relatedness will be very less. In some species, colonies may be founded by more than one queen. Again, relatedness will decline, and many uh, eusocial non hamenoptera are deployed. Okay, so there is no haplo uh, deployed there, and many hymenoptera are not eusocial. So, what is the exact relationship between eusociality and haplo diploidy? It has been suggested that uh, eusociality may have arise three different times, and it is associated with nest building and need to supply larvae with the food. It may facilitate evolution of uh, eusociality. Haplo diploidy may be facilitating evolution of eusociality, but a more important factor may be the need of help in rearing the young. Another example uh, is that of naked mole rat, Herocephalus glaber, which is a very peculiar animal which lives in burrows, never, usually never, most of the time never comes out. And uh, it is very peculiar because it doesn't have any hair, it doesn't have, uh, it never uh, succumbs to cancer, it uh, ages very slowly, okay, and uh, it feels less pain. But apart from these uh, specific facts, these uh, rodents live in colonies or communities where there are a number of uh, rats living together and they are ruled by a queen. So several dozen rats live together and uh, they are led by one dominant queen, which is a single breeding queen and uh, there may be two or three sexually active males. Rest of the group, which can number up to 300, do not mate but are deployed as workers or as soldiers. These workers are not haplodiploid like the workers of the bee colony, but the colony members are highly inbred and the coefficient of relatedness, that is R, between them is as high as 0.81. That is 85% of matings occur between full siblings or between parents and offspring. Now, queens use physical dominance to coerce help from less closely related individuals. So how does uh, that happen? Let's see this particular graph. Here we see that queen uh, shows individuals who are not working properly. And it can be uh, seen that non relatives are subjected to more shows as compared to offspring or siblings which, who are subjected to lesser sh uh, show. And aunts and uncles are also subjected to show but lesser than those subjected, to, subjected uh, by the queen to non related. So uh, it shows that there is a distinct uh, relationship uh, uh, behavior occurring here wherein uh, the siblings and offspring are more, uh, made to work less as compared to the one who are non relatives now coming to uh, the last aspect of the altruism the example of altruism is reciprocal altruism which obviously means that i help you you will help me whenever times are difficult for me you will help uh, me and whenever times are difficult for you i'll help you but that should uh, that should occur when there is no cheating behavior between uh, me or you. So uh, here in reciprocal altruism what exactly happens is there is cooperative behavior among non-kin. The necessary conditions for this to occur are or th for this particular behavior to evolve are the fitness cost to the actor must be less than the fitness benefit to the recipient. That means I should I should not die in order to help you because you are not my relative so I should not die to help you. I should help you but the cost must not be so much that it harms me uh, to an extent that uh, the uh, the cost becomes much more than the benefit uh, which uh, which is being accrued to you. And the non-reciprocators, uh, that is, those who do not repay in, uh, in kind, they should be punished in some way. Because otherwise, 
the alleged that caused cheating that means i helped you but you will not help me when i require that is cheating and these alleles will display the alleles for altruism so in effect what will happen over a period of time nobody will be helping anyone so condition that favor evolution of reciprocal altruism are stable social groups so that individuals know each other if the groups are not stable then i uh, if you are uh, if you will not be here tomorrow then uh, there is no chance of me helping you if you are going to stay here for a long time then only i'll help you so that you can help me in time of need so there have to be stable social groups so that individuals are involved in repeated interaction there uh, should be lots of opportunities for altruistic interaction during the, uh, an individual's lifetime the individual should have good memory so that they do not forget whom they help and there should be symmetry of interaction between the potential altruist okay so all should get a chance to help each other so one example is that of vampire bats desmodus rotundus which survive by drinking blood of animals the basic uh, the basic social unit uh, in this particular colony of bats is 8 to 12 females and their dependent offspring that frequently live together or roost together many individuals preferentially associate with one another when roosting and the altruistic act which they show to each other is they regurgitate the blood meals uh, which uh, which which are taken by them 33% of the young and 7% of adults fail to get a blood meal on every given night and if this continues for 3 days then uh, the individual dies so what happens is those individuals who uh, who are uh, who are uh, lucky enough to get blood they will help their uh, their partners or their uh, associates and they'll regurgitate blood uh, and they'll give it to them so that they survive Uh, and if uh, so happens after some day that the individual who gave the blood he is not able to get the blood or she is not able to give, get the blood then those individuals who got the blood from them they will regurgitate and give it to them so this happens uh, uh, bats which were which are, were more likely to receive blood from individual that they had fed previously so they remember to whom they are giving the uh, giving the blood and they will ask the blood from them and they will receive the blood and uh, in turn so that is basically how you help each other even when you are not uh, related and it helps in survival of society as a unit so altruism can be uh, between the members of the family which share genes which ensure that genes are passed from one generation to the next generation if not from the individual then from the kin also there is another form of altruism which is reciprocal altruism which ensures that Uh, the complete colony survives by helping each other so that also is a lesson for us that we must also be altruistic to individuals and we must also help each other whenever we are in times uh, whenever there are times which are difficult so that will be all for today thank you